Hello and welcome to video two for week four. In this video, we're going to use matrices to encode and solve systems of equations. Let me remind you what we're talking about with systems of equations. I have some number of variables. If they are n variables, I'll number them x1 up to xn. I have some number of constants, one for each variable, and then an additional one. And the linear equation is what I get by multiplying the variables by constants, adding them up, and making them equal to some additional constant. There are various approaches for solving systems of equations. Some of you have been taught to isolate and replace other types of algebraic manipulation, moving things around in the equations. Um, sometimes you can add and subtract equations from each other, and that will isolate a variable that you want. There's lots of different ways of doing this. However, it's a true fact that all of these ways can, in fact, be reduced to three basic steps. And if I want to come up with an algorithm to solve any kind of linear system, I would like to break down a solution to its most basic operations. And it turns out that if you allow yourself to multiply equations by constants, to add an equation to another equation, and then for keeping track, reorder the equations, these three things let you do all of the other solution techniques. These three things will be able to solve any linear system. So eventually we're gonna use this to build an algorithm. Before we do this, we have to figure out how to keep track of information. And that's where matrices come in. We're going to encode linear systems as matrices to keep track of the information. So in this, in this sense, a matrix is basically a bookkeeping or indexing tool for systems equation. It keeps track of all information so that when we run an algorithm that tells us how to solve things, we don't lose track of what equation am I on, where are my pieces, they're all nicely there organized in a matrix. How do we do this? Well, if we have some number of equations, each equation becomes a row in the matrix. And the columns are the constants. This A1 shows up here. This A1, 2 shows up there, so forth and so on. The variables are now missing. The variables are implicit that this column is for x1, this column is for x2 all the way down, this column for, is for xn, and this column is for the constant. So that positional thing now keeps track of the variables and this line keeps track of the equal sign. We defined an extended matrix in a previous video as a matrix with an additional separation. We're allowed to do that. The purpose of the separation here is to remember where the equal sign was. In this way, we get all the information. We could completely recover the equations if we want by knowing that each column refers to a variable. Let me do some examples to make this clear. Here are three equations in three variables, x, y, and z. Let's translate them into a matrix. So the coefficients here are negative 1, 3, and 6. Those show up as negative 1, 3, and 6. I've got my vertical separating line, and then my constant 1 shows up there. Here I have 2, 2, and 2. So this row is going to have 2, 2, and 2. And its constant, negative 6, shows up there. 5, negative 5, 1, constant 0, shows up there. All the pieces are there. The rows, the first col or the columns give us the variable. The first column is the x column, second column is the y column, third column is the z column, fourth column is the constants column. So all the information gets pulled from the system and thrown into the matrix. Let's do another one. I'll try and write a little bit less over this one so it doesn't become as obfuscated. So in the first equation, constants are negative 3, negative 10, 15. They show up there. The uh, constant negative 34 on the other side the equal sign shows up there equal sign again is represented by the vertical line second equation becomes the second row 20 negative 119 there's your 20 negative 119 the other side the equal sign the 25 shows up there third row 32 51 negative 31 those coefficients show up there and the constant 16 shows up there this is the x column this is the y column this is the z column and the column after the separation, after the vertical line, is the constants column. Sometimes we don't write all of the variables in our equations. That means that the variable doesn't show up. So what does that mean for the matrix representation? Well, here I've got a 1 from the z, a 1 from the x, and a negative 2 from the z. There are no y's. Well, that means I have 0 y's. I could certainly write this with a plus 0 y in it, because multiplying anything by 0 gets rid of it. So if a, if a variable doesn't show up, then it shows up as a zero in the matrix representation. Likewise, there's no x 
in the second equation, so the second row has a zero for the x, and there's no z in the third equation, so the third row has a zero for the z. Everything else translates down. Those zeros represent the missing variables. All right, now I have a system for putting my um, system's equations into matrices. I said there were three basic operations. Let me now change those basic operations into things I can do to a matrix. The first basic operation was multiply an equation by a non-zero constant. Each equation became a row, so this is now multiply a row by a non-zero constant. I can change the order of the equations. Well, that, this is now exchanging two rows of the matrix. And I can add an equation to another one. Often we sort of combine this a little bit with part one by adding a multiple because we can multiply then add. So adding a multiple of an equation from one row to the other. Um, it's now adding rows to each other. And these are going to be called row operations. And these are things we're going to actually do to manipulate a matrix. We'll multiply rows by constants. We'll add one row to another row. We'll exchange two rows. And this way we'll adjust the rows and see what we can do to try and solve the system. The goal is to get to a point where the matrix describes a solution. So I want to give you some examples of where we're getting to. Look at this particular matrix. If we go back and think of this as the x, and this as the y, and this as the z, this line is equal, this is the constants. If I translate this back, the first equation says 1 times x plus 0 times y plus 0 times z. Well, that's just x equals 3. The second equation, only the y shows up, says y equals negative 2. The third equation, only the z shows up, says, says z equals 8. That's a solution. That's no longer a system of equations. That tells us exactly what we want to know. The idea behind encoding things in matrices and then using row operations is to turn the matrices via the row operations into something where we can read off solutions. The form we're looking for as a name, it is called the reduced row echelon form. And it has some very strict properties. Let me go through what these properties are. Remember, this is the goal we're trying to get to. We're going to use row operations to turn matrices into this form. So in reduced row echelon form, each row, the first non-zero entry, so starting from the left, the first non-zero has to be a 1. These are called leading ones. If a row is all zeros, that's fine. It doesn't have any first non-zero entry, so it won't have a leading one. But all other rows, the first thing we go from the left that we hit in a row has to be a one. Each leading one has to be in a column where all other entries are zero. So above and below the leading one, we need zeros. If I have a column without a leading one, I've got no restrictions on it. So if all of these things are true, we have a matrix that's called reduced row echelon form, and that's going to be our goal. So we're going to try and construct reduced row echelon form, and this is an algorithm called row reduction. We're going to try and make leading ones. The leading ones have to be in columns of zero, so as soon as we make a leading one, we're going to try and clear its column so that it shows up in a column where all everything else is a zero. As soon as we made a leading one and cleared its column, we'll move on to a different row, look for another leading one, try and clear its column, and then when all rows start with leading ones, or are just rows of zeros, and all the columns are cleared, that's going to give us reduced row echelon form. So this algorithm, make a leading one, clear the column, make a leading one, clear the column, is going to produce this reduced row echelon form, and it only uses the row operations of multiply a row by a constant, add one row to another, and exchange the rows. One definition that I should mention here before I finish this already somewhat long video the number of leading ones is an important piece of information. It's going to show up in a lot of what we're going to use these matrices for. So it is a name. It is called the rank of a matrix. The rank of a matrix is the number of leading ones in its reduced row echelon form. The reduced row echelon form is unique. There's only one reduced row echelon form. So the number of leading ones in that form is a number that's um, totally determined. There's no, there's no way to produce multiple different ranks. A matrix has a unique rank is the number of leading ones once you've done the row reduction and put it into reduced row echelon form.